ok, partiti. Allora, dicevo appunto, diciamo, richiamo nelle prime 3-4 slide le cose che abbiamo visto la volta scorsa, perché ci aiuteranno anche a, capire, a seguire meglio la lezione di oggi. Quindi la volta scorsa, se vi ricordate, abbiamo mh, introdotto il concetto e il numero quantico di isospin, eh, visto che in realtà eh, non è altro che il risultato di una trasformazione globale di un gruppo SU2, e abbiamo visto anche come di fatto uh, è possibile ottenere sistemi composti. Allora, vediamo un attimino. The strong force uh, is independent of the electric charge, and uh, indeed the experimental evidence uh, derives from the equivalence between the proton-proton, neutron-proton, and neutron-neutron interactions once the Coulomb effects are subtracted. So if we are able to subtract all the electromagnetic effect, then what remains is completely uh, blind with respect to the uh, uh, ele electric charge, And so the strong force is completely the same, exactly the same for protons and neutrons. Now, uh, protons and neutrons, which have almost the same mass, and this is, of course, extremely important uh, when we speak about uh, isospin symmetry, can be regarded as uh, uh, two different charge states of one single strongly interacting object, which we call nucleon, capital N. So the nucleon comes in a two, let's say, degenerate state, the proton and the neutron. And then we assign this new quantum number, that is isospin. In particular, for the nucleon, we assign a quantum uh, isospin equal to one half. And then we distinguish the proton and the neutron in terms of the third component of isospin, that is either plus one half for the proton and minus one half for the neutron. Now, at the fundamental level, this also applies at the quark uh, level. Okay, so uh, in exactly the same manner, we assign an isospin one half to the up and down uh, isospin doublet. And essentially, again, we distinguish between the up and the down through the third component of isospin, which is plus one half for the up, the up quark, and minus one half for the down quark. And then we can obtain the proton uh, in general baryons and uh, um, mesons by combining either quark two quark doublets or a quark doublet with an anti quark doublet. Now, as I was mentioning before, isospin transformation form an SU2 group, so a special unitarity group of rank two of global transformation of the form uh, E equal to minus i half theta i tau i where, as usual, the theta i are the parameters of the transformations, and the tau i are the generator of this global transformation, which are conventionally chosen to be the three Pauli matrices. Okay, so this is, of course, a global transformation, so there is no dependence of the parameter on the space-time coordinates. And this uh, theta i can actually be regarded as three Euler angle in this uh, abstract isospin space. Now, as we see, as we've seen last time, uh, Pauli matrices are said to constitute a fundamental representation of SU2. This is, uh, of course, uh, in language of group theory. And the basis for this representation is conventionally chosen to be the eigenvectors of the third Pauli matrix, tau3. And in fact, we um, show that either if you assign to the proton or the up quark uh, state 1, 0, and to the neutron and the down quark state, 0, 1, then we obtain that they are eigenstate of tau3 with respectively eigenvalue plus 1 and minus 1. And uh, let me also remind you that the only physical meaningful isospin transformation is the one corresponding to a pure up-down exchange or proton-neutron exchange, which corresponds to a plus or minus pi rotation about the two axes. And you see the transformation below. So the rotated uh, up quark in this specific case becomes the, uh, the down quark and the rotated down quark becomes the up quark. And this we also showed. Now, uh, what about compound systems? So baryons are bound system of three quarks. And so um, uh, you have to, to, to combine three quark uh, isospin doublet. So a system of three isospin doublets decompose into a, an isospin three half quadruplet and two isospin one half doublets. This is a, a result of uh, group theory, which we will not go into detail, of course. At, uh, what about now the symmetry of these uh, multiplets? So concerning the quadruplet, this is completely symmetric under exchange of any of any pairs of quarks. Okay, whereas uh, the two doublets have either a mixed symmetry or a mixed anti-symmetry, which means that, uh, for instance, for the mixed symmetry, 
uh, these states are symmetric only under exchange of the first and the second particle. And for the mixed asymmetry, these states are anti-symmetric only under exchange of the first and the second particle. So there is no specific symmetry when you change the first and the third or the second and the third. What about mesons? Uh, mesons are, as you know, Q, Q bar bound states. Um, the four possible isospin states of light mesons are obtained from the combination of an SU2 quark doublet and, of course, an SU2 anti quark doublet, isospin doublet. And then one obtains uh, an isospin triplet state and an isospin singlet state, much like what we obtain when you combine the um, three, um, two, spin, two spin one half fermions, for instance. And in particular, as we saw at the very last, uh, at the end of the, the last uh, lesson, lesson, the three pions, so the pi plus, pi zero, and pi minus, constitute uh, an isospin triplet with uh, total isospin equal one. And uh, these are the three projections along the third axis. So plus one for the pi plus, zero for the pi zero, and minus one for the pi minus. Okay, so this was a summary of what we learned last time. Let's now move on. So. Uh, the concept of isospin is not only useful for classifying hadrons, as we have just seen, but also for constraining their dynamics. And the, the, point, the, the important point is the following. Uh, since isospin is conserved by strong interaction, any reaction or decay occurring through the strong interaction must have the same total isospin in the initial and in the final state not only the total isospin, but also the third component, because both are conserved in strong interactions, okay? If you remember, in electromagnetic interaction, only the third component is conserved, and in weak interaction, none of those is conserved, okay? So if we know we have a reaction or a decay that we know that proceeds through the strong, strong interaction, we have to uh, ensure and enforce that uh, total isospin and third component of isospins are conserved. And this allows to put strong constraints also on the cross sections of these processes, as we will see today. Now, uh, to understand qualitatively, quantitatively, sorry, how isospin conservation constrains the relative values of the cross sections of strong processes, we have to introduce the Klebsch Gordon coefficients, which allow to properly write the isospin wave function of composite system. Or imagine, okay, the coefficient of Klebsch Gordon, they have just studied in mechanical quantistica, I don't know. Sapete di cosa stiamo parlando? Sì, sì. Ok, va bene. Comunque diciamo, li, li riprendiamo lo stesso perché appunto ci servono poi per, per, risol per risolvere i problemi. Quindi adesso passiamo alla lavagna e definiamo i coefficienti di Clevy Gordon e come anche possono, sono tabulati, eccetera. Va bene. Ok, allora andiamo qui. Allora, questa è la pagina 1. Okay, so uh, let's consider a system of two particles which come with the isospin uh, states uh, either I1, I13, and I2, I23, where three means the third component as usual. Okay, now starting from these two uh, isospin states, we can construct two bases. The first basis is made in this way so we have I1, I13. I2, I2, 3, which are simultaneous eigenstates of I1 squared, I2 squared, I1 third, and I2 third. Just to give you an example, uh, let's write down the eigenvalue equation for the squared isospin operator for particle one. So this is I1, I1, three, I2, I2, three. And then the eigenvalue will be just using the same, exactly the same algebra of spin. I1, I1 plus one, H bar squared. And then you have your eigenstate I1, I1, three, I2, I2, three. Or another example is when you apply these uh, for the third component of isospin. So for instance, I1, three to the same eigenstate, then the eigenvalue will be I1, three H bar. And then you have again the same eigenstate, okay? Now, this is the first basis. 
okay? Then you can also construct a different basis, which is uh, written this way. So you have I1, I2, total I, and I3, okay? So I is now the total. I is a spin of these uh, partic two particle system. And I3 is just given by the sum of the two. So I1, three plus I2, three. And these are simultaneous eigenstates of I1 squared, I2 squared, I squared, and I3. Okay, and again, let me give you some example. So the I1 squared applied to the state I1, I2, I, I3. Give us I, I1, sorry, I1 plus one H bar squared. And then we have our eigenstate, I1, I2, I, I3. Uh, another example could be the third component, for instance. So this is the same eigenstate. And then the eigenvalue will be I3, H bar. And then we have our usual eigenstate, okay? Now, uh, of course, we can relate these two uh, bases in a straightforward way, and this is the way. So first, we start with the first one, I1, I1, 3, I2, I2, 3. Let me just copy this again here. I1, I1, 3, I2, I2, 3. So, of course, this equality holds only if in this blank space we have essentially the identity operator, okay? That you can also write, as you know, in terms of the completeness relation. So this we can write as the sum over i or i3 of i1, i2, i, i3. And then we have here i1, i2, i, i3. So this constitutes, of course, an orthonormal uh, complete basis, okay? So overall, this guy here gives you the identity operator. Okay, don't let me, don't call it I, does not make confusion, okay? You know, this is exactly one, okay? But now we can rewrite these uh, in a better way, in a more useful way. So we can put the sum here, I, I3, and then we have I1, I2, I, I3, I1, I1, 3, I2, I2, 3. And then we have our state, I1, I2, I, and I3. Okay, I go fast because uh, you should know all this already. And then what we have here is what we call the klebsch gordon coefficient. Okay, so is CI, I3. Okay, so in a sense, the klebsch cord coefficients are the weight that we use when we make a superposition of our um, isospin state for the composite system. Okay, so this we can also write uh, uh, better. Let me change page here, or maybe we can also write here. So, yeah, so at the end, we can write, even in a more compact way, that I, I want three, I two, I two three, we can expand as the sum over I, I three of our klebsch gordon coefficient, so C I, I three, and then the state we can write in a compact way as I, I three, just like this, okay? Now, this is the formalism. This is the way the klebsch gordon coefficients are introduced. And now we will see some, of course, examples and how to use them practi practically. Okay. Cambiamo um, pagina. Okay. 
So again, suppose we have a system of two particles. So again, we let me write down the isospin states of this is of these two particles, I1, I1, 3, and I2, I2, 3. Now, as we've seen the total component of uh, uh, the total third component of isospin, so I3 is simply given by the sum uh, of the third components, I2, 3. Whereas, if you want to calculate uh, the possible values of the total isospin, you have to use, again, the same algebra of spin. So, as you know, this must be A1 minus A2 in absolute value, I, and then I1 plus I2. So, the total isospin can take all the values that are included in this range. Let's take an example. Okay, so let's consider as an example the pi minus proton system. Okay, we will come back to this example later on, but let me just start with this. So for the first particle, it is a pi minus. So we have that I1, I1, 3 is gonna be I of the pi minus and I3 of the pi minus. We know that the pions are constitute an isospin triplet. So the total isospin for a pion is one, and the third component for the case of pi minus is minus one, as we have just seen. Hmm? Now, what about the proton? For the proton, we have I2, I2, three, is the total isospin of the proton, the isospin of the proton, and the, isospin, the third component of the isospin of the proton, and this we know it is one half plus one half. So these are the individual isospin states of our two particles, the pi minus and the proton. Let's now combine them, okay? So the total third component of isospin is given by the sum i third pi minus plus i third proton. That is minus one plus one half that corresponds to minus one half. What about the total? Now we have to calculate this range here. So I pi minus minus I proton I, and then we have I pi minus plus I proton. So we now just substitute the numbers. So this is one for the pi minus, then we have minus one half for the proton, then I, and then one plus one half. So, as a result, we have two possible, we have a range that goes from minus one half, sorry, it's from one half to three half. And so we have two possible values, one half and three half for the total isospin. That means that uh, the pi on, the pi minus and the proton can combine themselves into uh, either an isospin one half or an isospin three half total isospin. Okay, and in practice, it is indeed a superposition of these two states, okay? So the total isospin state in general would be I1, I1, 3, I2, I2, 3. When we make the, uh, the proper superposition, we have to take into account the Klebsch coordinate coefficients. So C, I, I3, and then we have our states. So this is general. Now for the case of our pi on proton system, we're going to have i pi minus i3 pi minus i proton i3 proton. This is going to be, we have only two terms in this sum. So the first term is, uh, uh, let's say, one half minus one half, then this is weighted by the Klebsch gordon coefficients, the corresponding Klebsch gordon coefficients. And then the other term is three half minus one half, weighted by the corresponding Klebsch gordon coefficient. Okay. Tutto chiaro fin qui? Sì, per me sì. Sì, sì. Sì, sì, sì. 
Ok, va bene. Se vado troppo veloce, rallentatemi. Va bene. Ok, so now the question is uh, how to obtain the values, the numerical values of these Klebsch Cordon coefficient. Ok, and the Klebsch Cordon coefficients are, uh, as you know, they are tabulated in a very uh, smart way into subtables of this type. So let me uh, write down the type of table. So here we have i1 times i2. Here we have i13. I two three, etc. for the system of particles. And here we're gonna have I, all the possible values of I, okay, and the possible projections, so etc. etc. I three, etc. And here in these white blocks here, you're gonna have plus or minus the squared Klebsch Gordon coefficients. So to be uh, concrete, let's have a look at the real table. So let me switch now to the, to the slide. Okay, so this is how the, uh, the Klebsch-Gordon uh, coefficients are tabulated. So in our case, we have a pion and a proton. So this is the table we have to look at because one for the pion, one half for the proton. And then as we have seen, the third component of the total isospin is minus one half. And then we have two possible values for the total isospin, which is three half and two half. Okay. These are the three, the, 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 the third projection of the two particles. So minus one for the pi minus and plus one half for the proton. And so overall, we have just to cross this table and we obtain here the plus or minus the squared values of the klebsch cordon coefficients. Okay, so one third and two third. We will come back to this table also later on. Okay, so now by using these uh, simple uh, tables, okay, we can immediately e obtain the values that we need. So let me now go back to our case. So in our case, uh, the corresponding table is, let me just write it here, is one times one half. Okay, this is for the pi minus, this is for the proton, of course. Then uh, we have minus one as a third projection for the pi minus and plus one half as the third projection of the proton. Then we have the two as a spin value, which are three half and one half. The two third projection, which of course is the same, minus one half and minus one half. And then the two values that we obtain from the table, which is one third and minus two third okay so we are now able to write down our composite isospin state so i pi minus i pi minus third component i proton i proton third component this is going to be square root of one third it is the weight for the state three half minus one half minus square root of two thirds and is the weight for the other as a spin state that is one half minus one half okay so this is the way to correctly write down uh, the isospin state of a system of two particles by taking properly into account the corresponding klebsch gordon coefficients. Now we will make a lot of use of these in the exercise today. Okay. So before going back to the slide, let me continue on the board here. And let's consider now two uh, examples and let's now see how indeed uh, isospin conservation constraint relations between uh, cross sections. Okay, so let's open a new page here. All right. Oh, okay. Questa è la pagina 3. So let's consider two strong reactions.
that means reaction that proceed through the strong uh, interaction of course so the first one is a proton plus proton that goes into deuteron plus by plus and the second is a proton plus a neutron that goes into deuteron plus uh, plus uh, no this is a pi zero sorry plus pi zero all right so let's start from the first one let me first of all remind you uh, the isospin state of all uh, the participants here so i3 i1 i3 of the proton we know is one half plus one half then i1 i3 for the deuteron is zero zero So the deuteron is in, we said it is uh, an isospin singlet, okay? And now uh, I, I3 of the pi plus, of course, is one plus one, okay? So these are our, let's say, ingredients. Let's now prepare the dinner. So we have, let's consider the initial state, so the proton plus proton, okay? So the third component of isospin for the initial state is given by the sum of the third component of the two protons. That is one half plus one half, that is plus one. So this is uh, the third component of the proton-proton system, so the initial state. Let's now compute the same for the final state. So I3F, that is I3 deuteron plus I3 pi plus. So for the neutron we have zero, for the pi plus we have plus one, and so this is plus one. So we are happy because the third component of isospin is conserved. It is the same in the initial and in the final state. And this is what we expect for a strong reaction, of course. What about now the total isospin? So we have to compute the, the range here, I proton minus I proton. So this is for the initial state, for instance, and then we have I proton plus I proton. And so we obtain zero, i, i, one. So we have two possible values, okay? So for the initial state, these two protons can combine either into a zero isospin state or a one isospin state. However, this is not completely true. So uh, la domanda che vi faccio adesso è, um, sono davvero possibili entrambi questi valori per l'isospin totale dello stato iniziale o dobbiamo subito scartarne uno? Dobbiamo scartarci. Sì, motivo? Perché abbiamo, dobbiamo conservare sia l'isospin lungo z che l'isospin lungo mm -hmm. i cioè l'isospin totale e se noi abbiamo un isospin uguale a 0 totale non possiamo avere un isospin lungo 3 pari a 1 esattamente questa è la risposta esatta ok quindi avendo un isospin 0 non potremmo mai avere isospin 3 uguale 1 quindi dobbiamo scartare l'ipotesi isospin totale uguale a 0 e quindi ci rimane soltanto una possibilità benissimo so we can write down the uh, isospin state for the initial state, that is i, 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 3i. And here we have just only one possibility, one plus one. So one, one, okay? Let's now consider the final state, okay? So here we have now ID, ID minus i by plus, if, id plus i, plus so this is zero minus one i f zero plus one and so in this case we have just one possibility that is total isospin equal to one and we are happy because this corresponds to the initial state isospin and we know that the two must be conserved okay so we can write down the final state sorry isospin we function as i f i 3 f also given by 1 1 
And so this is equal to the initial state. And we are all happy, okay? Now, let me uh, uh, start the following uh, reasonment. Suppose now that uh, we introduce uh, an isospin dependent interaction term. Let me call it, so it is a term in the Hamiltonian that depends on the total isospin. So this is, uh, let me call it explicitly isospin dependent interaction term. In the Hamiltonian. Okay, so the total Hamiltonian would be, for instance, the unperturbated or the for the free particle, let's say, plus this interaction term that depends explicitly on the isospin. Okay. Then, of course, the cross section for this process, so proton proton into deuteron pi plus, will be proportional to the matrix element that we can construct from the initial and final state that we just computed. Okay, through this interaction term. Right? So this we can write explicitly as 1, 1, h, i, 1, 1 squared. And we can also call this in a compact way as just m1 squared. Okay? Where 1 indicates that uh, the only isospin term uh, value is uh, plus y, 1. Okay? For this system. Now, let's now go to the second strong reaction. So proton neutron that goes into deuteron plus pi zero. Let me change, cambiare foglio qui. So now we attack the second reaction that is a proton plus a neutron that goes into deuteron plus pi zero. Okay, and we do exactly the same exercise. So for the third component, we have I3 uh, for the initial state of the proton plus I3 of the neutron. In this case, we have plus one half for the proton, but minus one half for the neutron. And this is gonna be zero, okay? Then we do the same for the final state, I3F, this is, third component of the deuteron plus third component of the pi zero. These are both zero, as we know, so this is also going to be zero. And again, we are happy because the third component is the same between initial and final state. So it's a strong process. Third component of isospin is conserved as we want. Now, let's calculate the total isospin. So for the initial state, we have I proton minus I neutron. C'è qualcuno che ha il microfono aperto? Se non avete domande, chiudetelo per favore. I proton plus I neutron. And so we obtain zero initial isospin, one. And so we're going to have two possible values, zero and one. Now, since in this case, the third component of isospin is zero, these two values are both possible. So this is the main difference compared to the previous case, okay? So in this case, we indeed can have both i equal one and i equal zero, okay? So our initial state, that is i, i, i third i, must be a superposition of these two states. So c, zero, 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 plus C1010. Now, in order to write this completely, we have to take the um, klebsch gordon coefficients from the tables. So let me uh, switch again on the slide. Allora, torniamo qui. Allora, in, questo, in this case, we have um, the initial state, we have a proton and the neutron, so they both come with a one-half isospin. In the final state, we have two possibilities, one and zero, with third component zero. So this is exactly the table that we need, okay? This is the proton, the neutron. These are the two third components for proton and neutron. These are the two possible 
values of the total ISO spin, one and zero, and these are the two third projection. So the values that we now need to take from this table is one half and one half, okay, for the two possible states. So, so we can write down the initial state wave function as a square root of one half, zero, zero, plus square root of one half, one, zero. What about the final state? So we do the same exercise again, id minus i by zero, if, id plus i by zero. So this is gonna be zero minus one in absolute value and zero plus one. So here the only possible value is one. And so the final state with function is simply given by if, and sorry, i three f equal to one zero. So indeed the situation is different now compared to the previous reaction, because now we are in the situation in which the initial state is a 50% mixture of i equal zero and i equal one states, while the final state is a pure i equal one state, okay? So again, uh, let's now try to write down the dependence of the cross-section. So the cross-section for this reaction, protons plus neutrons that go into neutron plus pi zero, must be proportional, as usual, to our matrix element squared, where HI is again an isospin-dependent interaction term of the Hamiltonian. And so these we can now substitute. We're gonna have one zero for the final state. Then we have our, our HI, and then we have to write down the full initial state that is square root one half, zero, zero, plus square root of one half, one, zero. Then we close here and we take the square. So we have, okay, only one term for the final state and we have two terms for the initial state, okay? So let's now decompose this. So this is gonna be square root of one half, one, zero, hi, zero, zero, plus square root of one half, one, zero, hi, one, zero. And all these must be squared. Now, what's the problem here? The problem is that the first term violates isospin conservation because initial and final state are different. So this term is forbidden by strong interaction, okay? We can never have this contribution here. So the only contribution we have is the second one, square root of one half, one, zero, hi, one, zero. All squared. And this we can further write as, uh, we can also go here, one half, we take the square we put outside and then M1 squared. Okay, written again in a compact form. And so now we can see what happened if we compare the two cross sections, okay. So if we put now in the numerator this last one, so proton plus neutron into deuteron plus pi zero, and then in the denominator the other one, proton plus proton into deuteron plus pi plus, okay? So the result will be one half m1 squared divided by m1 squared. That was our previous result. And so overall, the ratio between these two cross sections is exactly one half. Okay, so the one in the denominator is twice as large as the one in the numerator. And this is fantastic because it is exactly what is experimentally observed. As it is 
observed experimentally. Okay. So this is what I mean when I, uh, I say that um, isospin conservation applying, uh, requiring actually isospin conservation in strong reaction allows you to make constraints and also then therefore to make predictions for uh, cross sections. Okay. Adesso torniamo sulla slide. <clears throat> okay, so this summarizes what you have just seen. So the two strong reactions can proceed through uh, only through the I equal one channel. And consequently, one expects that the ratio of these two cross-sections must be exactly one half, as it is experimentally observed. Let's now consider uh, another uh, system of reactions that are essentially uh, pion to nucleon scattering processes, okay? Now, since the isospin of pions is one and the isospin of the nucleons, either proton or neutron, is one half, once we combine now the, the total isospin, okay, for the initial and final state, you get either one half or three half, okay? So let's consider all these four cases. The first three are clearly elastic scattering, where you have the, the same particle in the initial and the final state. The last one is a so-called charge exchange reaction. Now, for the first two, one finds that the total, um, the, third, the third component of isospin can be plus or minus three half, okay? And so, uh, for the two, of course. And so the total uh, one half is forbidden for the same reason that we have seen before. And therefore, these are described by pure three half isospin amplitude M three half. And therefore, the first two reactions have exactly the same cross section, okay? They're both proportional to uh, the M three half uh, matrix element squared. What about the others? For the other two reactions, one finds that the third component of isospin is minus one half, and therefore the total isospin can be now both possible, um, either plus uh, one half or three half. They're both possible, okay? And when you do the full calculation, the way we have just seen in the previous exercise, okay, you find that the cross-section for the, the third and the fourth, so number C, number D, cross-sections are given by this combination of matrix element. So the combination of three half and one half matrix element. Where now the coefficient that you see here are of course uh, suitable products of the corresponding cleft gordon coefficients. So we can now make <clears throat> a prediction about the ratio of all these uh, four uh, cross-sections, okay? And so if you now put all these together, you see that the first two must be equal and corresponding to the M3 half square, uh, matrix, square, uh, matrix element squared. And then they have to stay in this ratio compared to the second, to the third and the fourth one, okay? Where of course we put now this coefficient outside of the square. So uh, adesso memorizzate un pochettino questa relazione qui perché ci torneremo tra un paio di slide in un caso particolare, okay? Let me uh, uh, first introduce the concept of uh, hadronic resonances that we will of course uh, further develop during the course. So this is something that we already discussed in the past. So the lifetime of hadrons that can decay strongly, as we know, is extremely short, okay? We have also done some exercise. So order of 10 to the minus 33 or 10 to the minus 44 seconds. Now, from the experimental point of view, this decay time is so short that it is essentially impossible to reveal, reveal the tracks, their tracks, because they are too short, they decay immediately, okay? And so uh, <clears throat> they are seen to decay exactly where they are produced, essentially. So the production and decay vertex cannot be separated because they decay too fast, right? Um, and now these extremely unstable hadrons instead can be experimentally observed as resonances, okay? Now, we will come back to this, of course, later in the course, but let me just give you a few items. So tens of these hadronic resonances have been discovered uh, and their quantum numbers measured within the few uh, within a few years. So uh, essentially between the 50s and the 60s of the last century. Okay, and this was uh, indeed uh, the time where uh, the first accelerators of sufficiently high energy came into action. Okay, and also the first bubble chambers became available. Okay. So when these two conditions have been fulfilled, so uh, let's say around the 50s, tens of these hadronic resonances uh, were uh, discovered in a very short time, okay? 
<clears throat> and we will see the consequence of these uh, in the next lesson. lesson. Now, the largest and also the lowest energy resonance is the delta plus plus uh, 1232. This is the mass in MeV, uh, which was also the first to be discovered. Uh, and in particular, it was discovered by Fermi collaborators in 1952. And it is also the most studied one, okay? So it is a large, huge, and uh, low energy, so easy to produce and so easy also to be studied. And it was clearly observed in uh, the pion nucleon scattering when the center of mass energy indeed corresponds to the mass of this object, okay? And the width of this object, this resonance was measured to be order of 120 MeV, okay? And so one, once we now apply our uh, uncertainty principle, okay, uh, the way we have done already in some exercise, okay, we can infer the decay time of this hadronic state, okay, just by uh, taking the inverse of the, the decay width. And when you do this calculation, you obtain something in the order of 10 to the minus 24, okay, that is clearly the decay time of a strong, a strong interaction object. Now, this is the situation, okay, so this is this huge resonance. What you see here are the total cross section for a proton, a pi plus proton scattering okay and what you see here in the bottom is only the elastic part of the cross-section so as we already mentioned in the beginning the total cross-section is given by the sum of the elastic cross-section plus the unelastic okay that is given by all this this width here okay so this is the total and this is the elastic only now uh, <clears throat> so um now when we move now for our center mass energy above 3 GV, that is essentially above this point here, okay? Uh, you see that, okay, you have a big resonance here, they have, we have some smaller structure here and there, but beyond 3 GV, there is nothing essentially here, okay? Uh, in particular, if you look here in the, in the elastic cross section, okay? That means that above 3 GV, uh, the elastic cross section becomes uh, uh, suppressed Okay, and the total cross section is dominated by uh, the inelastic processes. Okay, so these two bump here and there are, are given by the elastic cross section here. Now, <clears throat> the delta plus plus is a pure isospin three half state. So if we now come back to the uh, uh, relation that we found before, okay. Uh, sorry, no, sorry. If we consider now the four, the four reaction here, okay, all of them can populate this, uh, this, uh, this resonance here, okay. But then the first, the first two uh, are given a proportional to the m three half uh, matrix element squared, and then the other two, okay, are given by this combination, okay. But in correspondence of the resonance, okay, which is a pure three half state, okay, we can neglect these two one half contributions, okay. And so now when we take the ratio of the first, for instance, the, the cross-section for the first reaction divided by the sum of the last two, okay, so sigma A divided by sigma C plus sigma D, then uh, only the um, three half matrix element terms contribute, and this ratio turns out to be three, which is again what we observe experimentally, okay. So this is again another proof that uh, um, isospin conservation allows you to constrain and so to make predictions also on the cross-section of strong processes. Okay, let me go now one step further. Chiore sono. Okay, see. <clears throat> so, let's now for the moment uh, introduce a, a new subject, and then the two of course will be merged together. So in 1943, by studying cosmic rays, with a cloud chamber immersed in a magnetic field, a new family of particles was discovered, all with a mass around 500 MeV. So this is a scheme of the uh, famous uh, Rochester Butler experiment. So essentially they had a cloud chamber that you see here in the center, okay? With a lead plate in between, essentially the same idea used by Anderson when he discovered the, the positron, if you remember, okay? But now the detector is more um, complex because we, uh, we have a trigger generated by three uh, Geiger-Muller counters, 
on here and to there. And also we have a, a huge uh, lead blocks, okay? So the lead shielding was used to ensure that only high energy events were recorded because the low energy will be, of course, absorbed immediately in the lead. The experiment was uh, performed at the sea level because this was in England and in England there are not uh, mountains, essentially. And then uh, what we call signal over a huge background, the signal was only a few events over uh, indeed uh, more than 5,000 photographs taken in the bubble chamber during uh, something like 1,500 hours of uh, data taking, okay? So what they found here? They found uh, the majority of the events were just a standard thing, okay? So pions or whatever, protons, so um, things that were already well known. But then there were a few strange events, okay? You see here the photographs for this bubble chamber. And you see here these uh, kind of uh, V shape or fork shaped events also here and there, okay? So they saw a few of them. And the interpretation was uh, the decay of an unknown neutral particle, because we don't see here the, the particle that decays into these two charged objects. Uh, so the interpretation was the decay of an unknown neutral particle of the mass in this range, okay? into a pair of charged particles being charged. Of course, they release some signal into the, uh, the bubble chamber. There was also another topology of events like this one. So you see something charged here, then decays into something also charged and something that you don't see, a neutral, okay? So again, the interpretation was a disintegration of an unknown new charged particle that you see here in the beginning of a mass in the order of 500 MeV into a penetrating charged particle, here is it, okay? And an unobserved neutral particle that should be should stay right, right there, okay? So uh, it took quite uh, some time to understand what is going on here, okay? And in fact, the situation was quite confusing at the beginning, okay? In particular, the experiment revealed the existence of the following new particles. Some were neutral, and decayed into two charged particles, plus possibly some also neutral unobserved particles, and these were called V0. Other, which were called theta, were charged and decay into charged particles plus neutrals eventually. Other decay into three charged particles and were named theta. Okay, so essentially they um, thought to have discovered the three new particles, V0, theta, and tau, unknown, okay, and with these kind of the decay topologies. However, <clears throat> indeed, it took a decade to establish that the theta and tau were exactly the same particle and that the V0 was just its neutral counterpart, the neutral partner. So today we know that these particles were the counts, okay, we call them uh, K mesons or counts. Uh, there are four of them two charged, the K plus and the K minus, and two neutral, the K0 and the K0 bar. So the mass is indeed of, the, of 500 MeV. These are the electric charges, plus one, minus one, and zero for the two neutral, of course. This is the isospin. So again, these two objects co corresponds to two isospin doublets, much like the proton-neutron systems, okay? So they both come with plus one half, and the two are distinguished by, again, the third component. So for the first doublet, we have plus one half for the K plus, minus one half for the K minus. For the second isospin doublet, we have uh, minus one half for the K zero and plus one half for the K for the K zero bar, okay? Now, why, uh, okay, let me also anticipate here that the, these two neutral uh, kaons, the K zero and the K zero bar, form a very interesting oscillating quantum system that we will study at the proper time, okay? And this is exactly the system where, for the first time, uh, CP violation was observed in weak interactions, as we will see. Now, <clears throat> soon after, okay, uh, their discovery, it was observed that counts were always produced along with another unknown particle, decaying into proton a pion. So again, this is another photograph in some bubble chamber, and this is the uh, decay chain. So suppose we have a cosmic ray that is a pi minus that at a certain point interacts with the material of the bubble chamber. Then as a result, you obtain, so this is the pi on track here, okay? Then you see some, nothing here, so, but then you see two decay products here, one here and one there, 
which are depicted here. So this is only possible if you are producing also two neutral particles that do not release any signal into the bubble chamber, okay? One of those decaying into a pion pairs, that is the K0 we know today, and the other one decays into a pion proton, okay? So we have now another class of object, which are not kaons. And these new particles are in fact a, a different type and are now commonly named hyperons. Okay. Now the, I, the lightest hyperon is indeed the, the, uh, the lambda zero, neutral. Then we have the three sigmas, sigma plus, sigma zero, sigma minus. And then we also heavier hyperons have been discovered in cosmic rays, which are the uh, cascade zero and cascade minus or C zero, C minus, if you like. Okay, so these tables now summarize the main properties of these hyperons, okay? Um, <clears throat> so first of all, they are baryons, they are not mesons. Uh, they are the name, they are the, the electric charge, they are the masses, okay? Tau is the decay time in picoseconds. And you see that uh, they are all big numbers here. So clearly all these objects decay weakly through the weak inter interaction. They cannot decay to the strong interaction, otherwise you would have, have something like 10 to the minus 24 seconds, right? And so this was one of the mysteries instead, as we'll see in the, in the next slide, okay? This is the C tau, so the, the, essentially the track um, 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 followed by, by this particle before decaying in, the, in their central mass system. And now these are the, uh, the principal decay modes with the branching ratio in percentage, okay? Now, <clears throat> why these particles altogether were called strange particles? Because indeed they had some strange behavior, okay? They showed some uh, important unexpected features. First of all, they were always produced in pairs and they were produced by fast, strong interaction processes However, they always decayed through slow, weak processes. So this was a totally unexpected behavior, okay? So also if you consider a, a decay between hadronic states like the, the, the lambda zero into proton and pion, this is, as we will see, a weak decay. It's not a strong decay, okay? So the combination of these two problems uh, led uh, the, the, the physics community at the time to call all these particles strange because they were behaving strangely. They were produced always in pairs, they were produced by fast, strong processes, but always decay through slow, weak processes, okay? Now, the solution was given in 1953 by Nishijima and Gelman with the introduction of a new quantum number that is strangeness we call it with S, which is additive just like electric charge or just like isospin, okay? So the strangeness is conserved by strong and electromagnetic interaction, but it is violated by the weak interactions. Now, <clears throat> the production by strong interaction from an initial strange equal zero state can occur only if the two particles of opposite strangeness are produced. And this is the reason why they are produced in pairs. So what do you mean here? If in your initial state, you have S equals zero, no strangeness, and your process is a strong process, then you expect that also the final state must have an overall strangeness equal zero, because strangeness is conserved in strong interaction as well as in electromagnetic interactions, okay? And this is the reason why you have to produce in pairs, because they come with opposite strangeness, okay? So overall, the, the, the total final state is also S equals zero. Now, the lightest strange particles, so the kaons and the hyperons that we just discussed, can decay only into non-strange final states because of energy conservation. And so they cannot decay strongly. They can only decay weakly. And this explains why, let me go back, we have these huge decay times here, okay? So all these decay are through the weak interactions. However, uh, if the mass of the strange particle is large enough, okay, then the final state of the same strangeness might, might be energetically accessible. In this case, of course, they behave like, a strong, with a, like strong particles. So they can be produced strongly, but they can also decay strongly in very short time. Okay. So in other, in other words, if there is a, a, a strange particle which is lighter than the one you have in hand, then the one you have in hand can decay strongly in a very short time. If the one you have in hand is the lightest strange particle, it cannot decay into 
more uh, light the strange particle because they are known anymore. And so the only way can decay is by violating strangeness. And so through weak interactions. Now, <clears throat> non-strange uh, light addons contain only up and down quarks, whereas, and this is now the, the modern interpretation, strange hadrons contain uh, one or more strange quark, okay? Now, by convention, <clears throat> the quark strangeness is assigned to by, uh, the, the quark S, the strange quark is assigned a strangeness minus one, and the anti-quark S, so S bar, is assigned a strangeness plus one. And this, this sign here reflects the sign of the electric charge. You know that the electric charge of the S quark is minus one third, okay? The electric charge of the anti-quark anti, anti is a corresponding plus one third. So the S quark has a strangeness minus one, and the S bar or anti-quark has a strangeness plus one. And as a consequence, uh, the S equal minus one hadrons, such as the chaons, uh, the, the lambda, contain one S quark. The S equal plus one hadrons, such as the corresponding antiparticles, contain one S bar quark. Uh, the Xi baryons have S equal minus two, so they contain two quarks, okay? Two S quarks, etc. In general, you can obtain the strangeness of a system, such as a baryon or a meson, by this difference. So the number of strange quarks minus the number of anti-strange quarks all changed by sign. And this summarizes essentially the strangeness of the particle that we have studied so far, okay? So the first line are all particles with, with zero strangeness, of course, all the photon, the pions, proton, neutron, uh, excited state of the nucleon, uh, the delta of, uh, resonances, etc. Then we have the first strange particle. So with positive strange means that they have an uh, S anti-quark. These are the corresponding with the S quark. So these are the antiparticle of those here. Then we have these double strange baryons, and then we have also a triple strange baryon, which is the omega minus, okay, which is an SSS state, and so it comes with a strangeness minus three. Okay. Ci fermiamo qui per una pausa. Avete domande? Sono stati studiati gli omega? Sì, 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 assolutamente. Anzi, erano proprio previste in base a questa categorizzazione, questo lo vedremo poi la prossima azione. Ci aspettavano perché appunto mancava un pezzo nel puzzle e alla fine sono stati scoperti esattamente con la massa attesa per raggiunto. Ma è recente come scoperto oppure? No, no, non è recente, ma um, non è avvenuta. Allora, tutti quanti fino alla XI sono, diciamo, scoperte fatte sostanzialmente mediante studi di raggi cosmici, perché non c'erano ancora acceleratori. La Omega invece bisognò attendere appunto la l'entrata in azione di acceleratori di particelle di energia sufficientemente alta, quindi a partire dagli anni 50. Ok. Ok, allora facciamo una pausa, facciamo poi tre esercizi dopo, facciamo... Che ore sono? Sono le 10. Facciamo i 20. Però ragazzi non disconnettetevi perché volevo un attimino chiedervi una cosa. Allora, ricominciamo i 20 la lezione. Allora, volevo chiedervi eh, una cosa, vediamo quanti siete adesso connessi. Ah, siete tutti adesso. Allora, innanzitutto, eh, se c'è ancora qualcuno di voi che non mi ha dato l'indirizzo email, per favore scrivetemi all'indirizzo email, perché ne ho solo, credo, sette di voi, o otto, non mi ricordo. L'altra cosa che volevo chiedervi è questa. Eh, allora, mi sono fatto un po' un calcolo veloce, e ho visto che, se andiamo avanti, seguendo il calendario didattico, quindi mercoledì e giovedì, il corso è di 27 lezioni, arriveremo al 18 di giugno, quindi chiuderemo il corso il 18 di giugno. Allora, la domanda che vi pongo è questa, per voi va bene o preferite, nel caso fosse possibile, trovare una terza slot settimanale a partire da maggio e quindi fare tre lezioni a maggio e quindi finire il corso prima? Ammesso che abbiate una slot libera, ovviamente. No, io non ho niente in contrario. Anche per me va bene. Ma per me vanno bene entrambi i casi, quindi... Allora proviamo, allora, di, di, di questa cosa qui, se, se nessuno di voi ha obiezioni su questa possibilità, ehm, esplorerò questa possibilità, quindi ne parlerò col coordinatore di corso Ilaria, vediamo se è possibile farlo. In ogni caso, l'informazione che mi serve a monte è se avete una slot di due ore libera eh, nella settimana, che potremmo utilizzare noi. Parlo. Eh, bisogna... Perché le, le raccolte sì. 
esempio il lunedì posso venerdì fino il venerdì però non so gli altri perché non seguono tutti ti, sen- ti ho sentito un po' attratti puoi ripetere per favore uh, lo screen Dov'è? non c'è la chat sì sì va bene scrivili Ovviamente deve essere una slot che, in cui siete tutti liberi, non avete intersezioni con altri corsi, cioè, altrimenti non se ne fa niente. Ma sì, potete anche fare così. Cioè, se, se non avete una risposta chiara adesso, eh, potete anche parlarne tra di voi e poi mi mandate una mail, va bene? Credo sia più comodo così perché... Sì, 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 va bene. Abbiamo vabbè. tutti i corsi diversi o quasi meglio. Che ci va bene, allora discu- per discu- perfetto, discutetela tra di voi, anche tra i ragazzi che sono assenti oggi, se, se avete come contattarli. Uh-huh. Eh, no, no, va benissimo, va benissimo. Non, non, d'altronde non c'è fretta, nel senso io pensavo eventualmente di fare questa cosa comunque a partire da maggio. Va bene. Quindi, sopra. <coughs> Fatemi sapere, allora, va bene. D'accordo. E non è neanche garantito che possiamo farla, insomma, mi informerò poi, vediamo se possiamo farla. Va bene, allora ricominciamo alle, insomma, tra 7 minuti alle 10.20. 10,
Ok, direi che possiamo riprendere, ci siete tutti? Mi sentite? Sì, sì. Benissimo. Io sì. Sì, sì. Ok, perfetto. Allora, adesso, via. adesso facciamo tre problemi. Ok, cominciamo con questo. So, uh, in which isospin states can the following three pi on system exist? So, pi plus, pi minus, pi zero, and three pi zeros. Allora, andiamo adesso di là. Questa è la pagina 5. Ok. So let's start with the first system that is a pi plus, pi minus, pi zero system. So we now have to combine uh, uh, three particles. We want to, uh, to calculate the isospin state of these combined three particle states. Okay, so the, the strategy is the following. First of all, we combine the first two and then we add the, the third one, okay? So let's start with, uh, let's combine first pi plus and pi minus. Combine first pi plus and pi minus. So now we know how to proceed. So the third component of the these two pion system is the sum of the two. That is uh, plus one for the pi plus, minus one the pi minus, so zero. Now let's calculate the total as a spin. So we have i pi plus minus i pi minus i pi pi and then we have the sum i pi plus plus i pi minus so this is going to be one minus one i pi pi and then one plus one so the possible values are now three zero one and two So now we go to the proper uh, Klebsch Gordon table. Now you know how to find for this table. Let me just uh, write it here. So this is a one times one because we are combining two pions. The third component are plus one and minus one. And then the total isospin is two, one, zero, and the third component will be zero, zero, zero. So once you look for this table, we would obtain here one sixth, one half, and one third. And so the wave function for this first pair of pions is one sixth to zero plus square root of one half, one zero plus square root of one third, zero, zero. And this is for the two pion system, but we want to calculate for a three pion system. So now we have to add the pi zero, okay? So now we calculate the third component of the pi 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 system. That is the third component of the pi pi that we just calculate plus that of the remaining pi zero. That is zero plus zero equals zero. And we calculate the total isospin i pi pi minus i pi zero and i pi pi plus i pi zero. And so here we have three possibilities, okay? So this is gonna be i pi pi equal one for i pi pi equal zero i pi 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 equal zero one two for e pi pi equal one and i pi pi equal one two three for e pi pi equal two okay so J pi, uh, e pi pi, sorry, e pi pi, 0, 1, and 2 are the three possibilities that we just explored before. 
when only considering the two piles, okay? So now we have to deal with all these uh, possibilities. Let's consider them separately. So the first case, I want to write here the e pi pi, in the case e pi pi is equal to zero, okay? And then here we only have one possibility. So the i, i3 of the three pi on system can only be one and zero, okay? Now, the situation for the other case is more complex. So let's consider now the e pi pi equal one. In this case, okay, we have to combine three isospin states. So we have again to deal with the klebsch gordon table. So it's one times one. In this case, we have i three pi pi equal zero and i3 pi 0 equal 0 also, so 0, 0. Then we have 2, 1, 0 in this case, and 0 for the third component. And then from the Klebsch-Gordon table, you obtain 2 third, 0, and minus 1 third. So only the assignment i equal 0 and i equal 2 are possible in this case. And so the isospin state for the combined system of three pions is going to be two third two zero minus one third zero zero so this is the first result this is the second result Okay, and now we consider the last case. Devo cambiare pagina. Pagina 6. So the last case is when the isospin for the two pi on system is two. In this case, uh, the situation is a little bit different. We have now a two times one with i3 pi pi equal zero and i3 pi zero equal zero. Then we have now three, two, one, zero, 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 and you would find the values three fifths, zero, and minus two fifths. And so in this case, the isospin state for the combined three pi system pi 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 is given by three fifth of three zero minus square root of two fifth one zero. Okay, so these are all uh, the possibilities. And so overall, so the, the pi plus pi minus pi zero system can exist in the following four isospin state. So the three zero, the two zero, the one zero, and also the zero zero. Okay, with different weights, of course. Now, this was for the case of the pi plus, pi minus, pi zero. Let's now go to the case B. Now we consider the three pi zeros, okay? So pi zero, pi zero, pi zero. And we repeat the exercise, okay? So the total I, uh, third component of isospin for the first two pi zeros is E3 pi zero plus E3 pi zero, that is zero plus zero, that is zero. Total isospin, D e pi zero minus I pi zero, I pi pi, i pi zero plus i pi zero. You obtain a range from zero to two. And so the possible values for the pi zero pi zero system are zero, one, and two. So again, we go to our 
table for the Klebsch Gordon coefficient. So in this case, we have one times one, zero and zero, two, one, zero, 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 and the values are two third, zero, minus one third. I think this we already seen before. So also in this case, uh, for uh, the, the pi zero, let's say i i3 of the pi zero pi zero system is going to be two third of two zero minus square root of one third zero zero. Now, as before, we add the third by zero. So the third component is gonna be i pi zero pi zero, i three pi zero pi zero plus i three pi zero. That is again zero plus zero equals zero. We calculate the total. i pi zero, i pi zero plus i pi zero. And here, then we have two possibilities. The results is one for i, for the case i pi pi zero equal to zero. We have two possibilities, okay, remember, okay, it's two and zero. And the other, i, pi, 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 equal to one, two, or three, if i pi zero pi zero is equal to two. You can just check by yourself. And so, as before, let's consider the three cases. So if i pi zero pi zero is equal to zero, then we have only one possibility, that is i, i3, for the three pions, equal to one, zero. If i pi zero pi zero is equal to two, instead, we have i, i3, pi zero pi zero pi zero, equal to the same combination that we've seen before. So square root of three fifths, three, zero. These are just the same Klebsch coordinates as before. And of two fifths, one, zero. And so overall, if we now consider the pi zero, pi zero, pi zero system, only the following two isospin can exist. So only three, zero, and one, zero. So the three neutral pion system can only exist in these two isospin states. Three, zero, one, zero. So the zero, zero and the two, zero are both not allowed in this case. Okay, chiaro ragazzi? Chiaro. Bene. Sì, sì, sì. Andi ok, andiamo al secondo problema. Okay, now find the relation between the cross sections of the following processes. Quindi abbiamo uh, pi meno protone in sigma 0 k0, pi meno protone in sigma meno k più e pi più protone in sigma più k più. Quindi faccio notare che nelle prime due casi lo stato iniziale è lo stesso, quello che cambia lo stato finale, mentre il terzo è diverso. Allora torniamo lì. Questo è il problema 5.2. Allora, meglio scriverlo in effetti. Allora, lo scriviamo questo è 7. Problem 
Allora, allora, anche qui diciamo, conviene prima scrivere tutti quanti gli ingredienti dei nostri protagonisti e poi dopo li mettiamo insieme quando servono. Allora, nucleons, questo lo sappiamo bene, protone è un mezzo, un mezzo, il neutrone, stiamo parlando di ovviamente stati di isospin, è un mezzo, meno un mezzo. Pions, questo è un tripletto di isospin, quindi abbiamo il pi più 1 più 1, il pi 0, 1, 0, il pi meno 1, meno 1. Caoni, allora come abbiamo visto i caoni formano due doppietti di isospin, e allora il k più è come il protone, il k0 è un mezzo meno un mezzo, e questo è il primo doppietto, l'altro doppietto è invece il k0 barra, un mezzo, un mezzo, e il k meno, un mezzo, meno un mezzo. E poi abbiamo i barioni sigma, sigma barions. Allora, questi qui formano un tripletto di suspin come i pioni, quindi avremo sigma plus 1 più 1, sigma 0, 1, 0 e sigma minus 1 meno 1. Ok? In termini di quark, ve lo dico, vi do pure questa informazione, comunque poi li vedremo queste cose. Allora, il K più è un sistema U S barra. Il K0 è un sistema D S barra. Il K- è l'antiparticella del K più, quindi è un sistema U barra S. E il K0 barra è l'antiparticella del K0, quindi è un D barra S. Per quanto riguarda le sigma, allora questa qui, la sigma più è un sistema up-up-strange, la sigma 0 è un sistema up-down-strange, vi faccio notare che la somma delle cariche elettriche di questi tre quark fa infatti 0, ok? Mentre fa più 1 in termini della carica elettrica dell'elettrone, <coughs> nel caso sigma plus, e chiaramente questo sarà un DDS, dove la carica elettrica farà chiaramente meno 1. <coughs> ok. Fatto questo preambolo, possiamo iniziare a risolvere il problema. Ok? So, let's start from the first case, that is, um, the first reaction is pi minus proton that goes into sigma 0, k0. Mm? Allora, third component of isospin for the initial state, this is I3 pi minus plus I3 proton, that is minus 1 plus 1 half equal to minus one half allora aspetta un attimo total isospin i pi minus minus i proton initial state isospin i pi minus plus i proton so this is gonna be one minus one half and one plus one half. So the possible values are one half and three half. And both values are possible because the third component is just one half, minus one half, okay? So for the initial state, we have to calculate the, we have to take the proper klebsch gordon coefficient. So it's one, <coughs> for the pi and pi minus, and one half for the proton. The projections are minus one and <coughs> plus one half. And the possible values are three half and one half with the third projection minus one half. So if you go, you go in your table and you would find one third and minus two third. And so the wave function for the initial state is one third 3 half 
minus one half minus square root of two third one half minus one half. Ok, now the final state, now se riesco a farlo tutto dentro questo foglio, so i3f is equal to i3k0 plus i3 sigma 0, that is minus 1 half plus 0 equal to minus 1 half, and of course we are happy because it is the same as in the, final st in the initial state. Then uh, for uh, the total, we have i, no, non trovo tutto stare qui. Uh, vabbè, andiamo avanti così i k0 minus i sigma 0 i f i k0 plus i sigma 0 and you would obtain again the two values for the final state are 1 half and 3 half so again this is uh, fine for us And then when you calculate uh, the, the Klebsch Gordon coefficient, I will not write down the table, you obtain now the final state wave function as square root of two third, three half minus one half, plus square root of one third, one half minus one half. And this is the final state. Now we have initial and final state, so we can compute now our cross section. So we go to a new page. And the cross section for the pi minus proton into sigma zero k zero will be proportional to the matrix element F H i i squared. That is, so now we have to substitute. So we have square root of two third, and then we have three half minus one half plus square root of one third minus, no, sorry, one half minus one half. Then we have H, and then we have the initial state that is square root of one third, three third minus one half, minus square root of two third, one half minus one half squared. So let's now decompose this. So we obtain square root of two ninths, and then we have three half minus one half h i, three half minus one half minus two third, three half minus one half h i, one half minus one half plus one ninth minus one half sorry one half minus one half h i three half minus one half and finally square root of two ninth one half minus one half h i one half minus one half all squared. Now we have four contributions here. Two of them violate isospin conservation. It is a strong process. So these two guys here do not contribute. And so this we can write in a compact way as a square root of two ninth m three half minus square root of two ninth m one half and so our cross section 
okay, for the, the this process pi minus pro, proton into sigma zero k zero will be proportional to two ninths of m three half minus m one half squared. Now, this, is, this was the, the first process. Let's now repeat the exercise for the second. So pi minus proton into sigma minus k plus. In this case, uh, it is easier because the initial state is the same. So we know already that the initial state isospin wave function must be one third, three half minus one half minus square root of two third, one half minus one half is just the same as before. What about now the uh, final state? So for the final state, we have I3F is equal to I3 of the K plus plus I3 of the sigma minus. In this case, the final state is different. So we have to compute this. So we have uh, one half for the K plus minus one for the sigma minus, and then we have minus one half. And then you can also compute, uh, you do by yourself, that the final isospin can have two possible values, so three half or one half, and both are possible. So again, we play around with the Klebsch Gordon, one times one half, minus one, plus one half, three half, one half, minus one half, minus one half and you find one third and minus two third and so we now also have the final state wave function as one third three half minus one half minus square root of two third one half minus one half Now, <clears throat> again, we go to the cross section. So the pi minus proton into sigma minus k plus. So this is proportional to the usual matrix element. And so we're gonna have here square root of one third. three half minus one half minus square root of two third one half minus one half hi and then we have the initial state one third three half minus one half minus square root of two third one half minus one half so <clears throat> what we have here one third of three half minus one half h i three half minus one half then sorry Oh, this we don't have here. Then the two central contribution are zero, so plus zero, plus zero, because they would violate as a spin conservation. And then we have just the last one, two third, one half minus one half, hi, one half minus one half. And so overall, it turns out that the sigma of this process, sigma minus proton into sigma minus k plus is proportional to one ninth. And then you have m three half plus twice m one half squared.
Now we just need to go to the last one. Andiamo a pagina. Pagina 9. So the last process was with a different initial state, pi plus proton into a sigma plus k plus. So let me go fast here. 3i is equal to 3 pi plus plus i 3 proton, that is plus 1 plus 1 half, that is 3 half. Then uh, the total isospin you will find in the usual way that you will obtain minus 1 half i i 3 half, sorry, 1 half and 3 half. But then since you have three half as a third component, you have to rule out the one half. And so the only possible assignment for the initial state isospin is three half. And so the initial state wave function can only be three half, three half. What about now the final state? So three F is equal to three k plus plus i3 sigma plus that is one half plus one that is of course also equal to three half the final isospin will be also three half and so the final state wave function will be again three half three half and so we now go to the cross section by plus proton into sigma plus K plus and this cross section must be proportional to the matrix element squared. That is now simply three half, three half, hi, three half, three half squared. That is m three half squared. And so overall, our result is that the sigma pi plus proton into sigma plus k plus must be proportional to this three half matrix element squared. Okay, now we have all the results in hand. We can write down the ratios between this cross section. Okay, so sigma A stays to sigma B, which stays to sigma C as two ninth m um, three half minus m one half squared stays to one ninth m three half plus twice m one half squared stays to m three half squared. So this is the ratio between these three cross section and we can consider two um, limiting case Okay, so the first case is when one can neglect the three one half compared to the three three half. And so in this case, if this happened to be true, then sigma A stays to sigma B stays to sigma C as just two ninth stays to one ninth stays to one. And so just as two two stays to one and stays to nine. And in the other limiting cases, when one can neglect the one third matrix element, then sigma A stays to sigma B, stays to sigma C as two nine, stays to four nine, stays to zero. That is equal to one stays to two stays to zero. Okay. Andiamo all'ultimo esercizio, facciamo velocemente. The neutral baryon sigma 0 uh, di massa 1915 MeV has isospin 10. Calculate the following ratio of decay rates. Quindi l'esercizio precedente era calcolare il rapporto tra sezioni d'urto di reazioni. Forti. Adesso invece dobbiamo calcolare il rapporto tra le decay rates di questi due decadimenti del barione sigma 0. So, uh, 
Allora, let's first calculate the isospin spin of the composite system, uh, the final state systems, ok? Quindi K0 neutron e K minus proton. Ah, so questo è il problem. 5.3. E questa è la slide. Cos'è la pagina 10? Ok, so I, I3 for the proton is one half, one half, as we know. I, I3 for the neutron is one half minus one half. These are our ingredients as usual. I, I3 for the K0 bar is equal to one half one half and then i i3 for the k minus is equal to one half minus one half so let's start with the k0 bar neutron system so the i3 is the sum of the two so is one half minus one half is equal to zero the total isospin you can compute yourself, you know how to do this. This is going to be 0 or 1, okay? And both values are possible. So we now search for the Klebsch coordinate coefficients. This is 1 half times 1 half. And we have 1, 0, 0, 0, 1 half and minus 1 half. And so we obtain the values one half and one half. And so our wave function for the K zero bar neutron case is square root of one half. And then we have one zero plus zero zero. This is for the first final state. Let's now work out the second final state. It is K minus proton. In this case, we have I3 is equal to minus one half plus one half, that is zero. And the total isospin for the K minus proton system is going to be zero and one. Again, both values are possible. Again, let's search for the Klebsch coordinate coefficients. So we have one, zero, zero, zero one half and minus one half and so i i3 of the k minus proton is square root of one half one zero sorry minus zero zero okay so these are the final states now we know that for the initial state Let's say, let's call it this way. It is the I, I3 of the sigma zero baryon. We know from the text that this is one zero. And so we can now calculate the, the two ratios. So sigma zero into K zero bar N, the decay width of this, in this final state will be proportional to the, matrix element sorry um, now uh, one of the square root of two zero zero plus one zero h i one zero squared that is one half, zero, zero, H I one, zero, plus one, zero, H I one, zero. Clearly the first one is forbidden. And so this turns out to be M one squared divided by two. For the other state, 
minus proton. We have the width, and this will be proportional to one over square root of two minus zero zero h i one zero plus one zero h i one zero squared. Again, the first one violates other spin conservation, and this is m1 squared divided by 2 also. And so, overall, it turns out that the ratio for these two decay modes, k0 and divided by k minus proton, is exactly 1, as it is also observed experimentally. Okay? So these two decay modes come with the same probability. Ok, finiamo qui. Se avete domande potete farle, naturalmente. Se non avete domande ci salutiamo. Domani non ci vediamo perché domani è San Giorgio, credo, quindi domani non c'è lezione. Ci si vede mercoledì prossimo. E eh, se riuscite fatemi avere, fatemi avere quell'informazione via mail, insomma, se riuscite a trovare una slot comune a tutti. Poi vediamo se si può fare. Va bene. Ok. Va bene. Allora arrivederci. Va bene, Va bene. arrivederci a mercoledì prossimo. Grazie. Arrivederci. 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 arrivederci.